On today's High Watt Soundbite, we're getting into the details of a mastering session. Well, I started my day today with a very specific plan of a particular session that I wanted to record here in the studio. You know, as I often do, I started my morning with a big, strong cup of coffee. And as that caffeine started to kick in, and I was looking at my, my calendar over the next couple of weeks, I suddenly realized that I absolutely have to do a mastering job today. This is the only day that I can do it. So I'm just gonna shift gears and invite you to sit in with me on a mastering session. Today's four song EP is a really perfect example because there are three different mixing engineers contributing to it, right? There's a couple of tracks that I've mixed and a couple of remixes that have come in that have been mixed by others. So grab a tea or a coffee or whatever your pleasure and let's master an EP. Okay, well, the very first thing that I'm gonna do in a typical mastering session is I'm going to get all the files that I'm gonna use into the same sampling format. In other words, I typically like to work in 4824, that's 48 kilohertz, 24 bit. And two of the songs that I've got, the original album version, as well as the, uh, the, the remix that, that we did internally as the band, those are both recorded and, and mixed at 48 kilohertz. Well, the two remixes that we commissioned were both uh, delivered at 44.1. You know, when it comes to converting sample rates for me personally, how I actually accomplish that changes from project to project. If I'm working on an entire project that's recorded at a particular sampling frequency and I need to get to a new frequency, more often than not, I will actually do that sample rate conversion through the actual capture of my analog chain. There is a perfect opportunity when you're mastering to do that sample rate conversion without an algorithm, right? Because literally I have to leave the digital domain and go into my analog gear and then come back to digital. So I have an opportunity to capture with a second machine, which I often do and really project dependent. What I will typically do in this situation is I'll use an algorithm. Well, the program that I prefer to do those sample rate conversions is Sample Manager. Killer program. In fact, I swear I have heard sample rate conversions that sound better than the original when I go back in AB. I don't know how necessarily, but you know, I just roll with it. Okay, so let's get started. I know I have two tracks here that I have to convert to from 44.1 to 48. So immediately I'm going to load up my uh, sample manager program and I'm going to go to the convert folder here and I'm going to open up uh, convert sample rate. I'm just going to drag that into this window. I'm going to set it for 48 kilohertz and I'm going to use the isotope resampler. Every time this isotope resampler sounds killer. Love it. You know, I leave the quality obviously on high and in the destination in this particular case, I'm going to make new files. So it's going to make new files in the same folder that these uh, source files live in. Now that I've got that in place, I can go ahead and grab both of these tracks that I need to convert, drag them into this window, select both of them and hit run. And it's that simple. It literally just takes a few seconds and I've done a lot of A-B comparison between this and other sample rate converters. For my ear, it's sample manager, no question. So I'm going to quit that. You'll see that it just puts that file in exactly the same folder and it just actually put the underscore 001 on it as an extension. So I can uh, differentiate which is which. Okay, so with that sample rate conversion handled, now I have my four songs for this EP. They're all at 48 kilohertz, 24 bit. So boom, let's open up Pro Tools. I'm gonna import those four tracks. I'm gonna go find them on my SSD drive here. I copy them, always. Personally, everything I add to a Pro Tools session gets copied into its audio files folder. Just a rule that I've, I've rocked with for a long time. Okay, hit done and open and yes, processing the audio. And immediately I can see that I got some work to do. I've got some of these mixes are kind of already pumped up, maybe look like they've already been through a bit of a limiter. Some of them have had no limiting whatsoever. I can see one of them is quite a low level. You know, just as a side note, when I'm mastering a, a project where there are multiple mixers who have contributed to it, absolutely I want all four of these tracks to be 
kind of like cohesive and I want them to be able to work on an EP together. But I absolutely want to maintain the individuality of these tracks. I mean, the reason we commissioned an outside mixer to even do a remix is because they have a particular kind of sound, right? I don't want to just start applying EQ and compression and, and all kinds of other stuff to try and just make those mixes sound like my mix. I, I absolutely don't want to do that. I want to maintain the sound of that artist's own mix. What I will typically do is shift all of these mixes so that so that I can kind of highlight one area of all four of these tracks where they'll all have lots of energy. That way I can sort of focus on that. I can skip back to a quiet part. I can listen to all the songs during a quiet part. So I really like setting it up this way. And inside of Pro Tools, what I will most often do is go to my solo mode, which normally is in latch, and I'll set it to X or cancel mode, which is where I can only have one track soloed at any given time. Anytime I, I solo another track, it cancels the solo I just had and solos that new one. Very, very nice feature for popping around and listening to different mixes, right? I think it's important to talk for just a second on, on just how I set up this monitor setup inside of Pro Tools. Because the one thing that I really love to have is multiple routing options within the same session. The track that I've got labeled as Layback, that is ultimately the track that I'm going to record back onto. Okay, that's my destination track. The input to that is just one of my free buses in my system. The beauty of that is I can be in the middle of my mastering session. And let's just say one of these three tracks, I don't know, let's just say it's not gaining what I want it to gain from that analog chain. Well, I can very simply just pull that one track out of that chain and do whatever else I want to it internally inside of Pro Tools. I can go down a whole digital path. It just allows me to be able to remove any one of these tracks from that analog chain and apply whatever I need to apply to that track and then ultimately add it to the layback portion without going through any of this. So it just allows so many different routing options and yet I can monitor everything through exactly the same final channel. Beauty thing. So I'm able to sit here and solo and go through different things and it all just feeds the right place. Okay, I'm about 90% on this mastering job. What I will often do right now at this exact moment is I'll just go ahead and lay back a bit of reference of me actually bouncing around these different mixes. So I've got different levels and some of them have different plugins and some of these tracks are going through the analog setup, some of them are going straight. So I'll just bounce around these different mixes and I'll print a small section the purpose of that is so that I can take that small segment and go kind of check out this mastering job on other systems. And I find this really, really handy and effective because, you know, how do you do those A-B comparisons? How do, you, how do you bounce around and listen to what you're doing on some of these other kind of consumer systems? It's much easier to create yourself a track, a stereo track that has you physically jumping around and changing that mix on the fly. It just provides a really good reference outside the studio. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. So that 45 seconds of audio that I just recorded, so, so cool to just be able to like have that thing jumping around and, you know, I could take it up to the living room and play it on the system up there. I can play it through the TV system. I can go play it through a Bose sound dock. I can listen to it in my car. It's sort of just a little internal trick that I learned over the years that really helps me out. And I really think it'll help you out. Give it a try, definitely. So I'm gonna export this little 45 second piece and go refresh my tea, go check it out on a few different systems. We'll take a pause and we'll come straight back. Okay, so I'm back from checking out these mixes and everything sounds really good. 
the original album track on this, I'm actually synthesizing some bottom with a plugin and I've got an equalizer plugin on this as well. I'm actually gonna go in that and just tweak it up a little bit more. You know, I like the effect, it's just uh, not quite enough. And the only reason I'm doing this in the first place is that these remixes, including our very own, the one Bon and I did, all of them have kind of bigger bottom than that original album mix, which is sort of kind of normal, so to speak, you know, when you're doing club mixes and stuff. But nonetheless, I still kind of wanted to tweak that one a little bit, just so it kind of brought it up to speed. So I'll go take a few minutes just right now, and I'll pay attention to just that. All right, I'm really happy with this mastering job, so I'm pretty much ready to start printing these mixes. So let's just take a minute and sort of review a truncated version of this setup. This is very typical of exactly how I master almost everything. I bring in all of the individual tracks that I'm gonna master into a Pro Tools session. I create a number of different auxiliary buses. One of those is designed to allow me to send whatever tracks I want of that group out to my analog chain, okay? My analog chain then returns to another auxiliary bus, and I'm not recording anything yet. This is, these are just strictly buses that I've set up. So that second stereo bus is picking up the return of that analog feed, and that is exactly where I add my limiter, of course. The benefit of going to analog before that limiter is very big, because there's just something that analog does to transients that sort of make them a lot easier to deal with in the digital domain once they've gone through that analog stage and back. So out to that analog, back in, limiter gets applied at that point, and then finally, lay back. I'm able to actually lay back that limited signal back onto my Pro Tools system. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this session as much as I have. And just remember, there really are no rules, right? I mean, you can basically apply just about anything you like to any process and just see what it sounds like. Use your ears, right? Some of the most unconventional things that I've done with mastering have been some of my best results. So the next time you're mastering, try a couple of these techniques because I think they're really gonna help.